In the previous videos, we learned that humanity arrived in the Japanese archipelago around 35,000 years ago, and that its colonization took place along three different routes – Taiwan, Okinawa, Korea, Kyushu, and Russia, Hokkaido. These migrations resulted in the emergence of the Paleolithic Japanese people, who were genetically diverse and physically very different from the Japanese who inhabit the archipelago today. As nomadic hunter-gatherers, the Paleolithic people didn't stay in one place for long. Their decisions regarding the movement of the tribe depended mainly on the migratory routes of animals, especially large prey. Everything that is known about the Paleolithic period, also called Kyuzeki, comes from observing and studying the stone tools that these populations left behind. Since Japan soil is particularly acidic, thanks to intense volcanic activity, and, as such, prone to degrading biological remains. It is not known whether Paleolithic man lived in caves or whether he was able to build rudimentary portable tents from animal skins. Scholars have also not yet been able to agree on a date for the end of this period, and therefore for the beginning of the era that followed, Jomon. This is because the Jomon evolved from the Paleolithic people, and this transformation did not happen overnight, but was rather a gradual process. During the transition period to the Jomon era, three important technologies were implemented – microblades and microcores, tools called Mikoshiba Shujakubu, the manufacture of which involves ceramics, and, finally, the emergence of linear relief ceramics. If I tell you that the Jomon people were also hunter-gatherers, you'll probably get the idea that they were a primitive, rudimentary society, a little more evolved than the one that preceded it. Ok, they discovered pottery. To what extent can that itself bring about change? As it turns out, it can bring a lot of change. Try not using any container for 24 hours. No cups, pots, glass jars for storing ingredients such as cereals or spices, and the list goes on. You wouldn't be able to carry liquids, including water, for cooking, or make any infusions. And good luck organizing your belongings so that they are not stored in a container. I'll join you in that exercise, but it will mean going all day without drinking coffee or black tea and without either of those things. I would be in a terrible mood and do nothing all day. So, I'm already pretty convinced uh, of the importance of ceramics. Also, I was, so, I was only half joking, but if any of you really go ahead with this, please don't put edible products directly on the floor. You don't want it to get all sticky. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about the Jomon era in more general terms, as well as about the technological innovations that characterize this ancient population. Perhaps I will also touch on the topic of the buildings they lived in, but only if that doesn't make the video too long. Otherwise, I will leave it for the next time. The Jomon period, Jomon Jidai, is often considered to be the longest in Japanese history, spanning approximately 10,000 years. The Paleolithic period, or Pre-Jomon, is technically as long or even longer than this. But there are texts that don't consider it possibly because of the great uncertainty regarding its beginning and end, or because it is very difficult to find accurate information about the populations of that time, or even because the texts were written in a time when the Paleolithic era was still in the process of being studied, which is why you'll sometimes find the claim that Jomon era is the longest of all. This is only true if we don't consider the Paleolithic. There are also those who prefer to lump these two eras together when talking about the subject, since one is the evolution of the other. But what is vastly more common is to treat, it, is to treat them as I'm doing now, as different eras. The American zoologist and the orientalist Edward S. Morse is considered the father of Jomon archaeology and the person responsible for the term. Morse was one of many foreign experts Oyatoi, Gaikokujin, bought to Japan in the Meiji era to modernize Japan. One day, while traveling from Yokohama to Tokyo Imperial University, where he was working, he saw, from the train he was on, an area of land from which several white shells protruded. He later asked the Japanese government for permission to excavate the area. The excavations, carried out by Morse and his students, took place in 1877, and the site became known as the Omori Shell Mounds. Shell mounds dating back to ancient times are not exclusive to Japan. Countless have been discovered in various parts of the world. 
They are abundant in the coastal areas of northern China and the Korean Peninsula, for example. Since 1877, several more shell mounds have been discovered in Japan, more than 25,000. But the Omori mounds in the Kanto region remain one of the most famous, as they were the pioneers. During the excavations, Morse found several pieces of pottery decorated in a peculiar way, as a result of the act of imprinting ropes on the surface of damp clay. In the report he published years later, and in the book he wrote, Shell Mounds of Omori, Morse referred to the pieces as being marked by rope, which was translated into Japanese by the term Jomon, which came to give the period its name. Other names, such as Ainu School Pottery and Shell Mound Pottery, were also used to designate the ceramics from this era, but after a few decades the term Jomon prevailed over, over the others. Even thought not all pieces of pottery from the Jomon period are rope marked. This is just one of the techniques used by the people of the time. As the most varied artifacts appear all over the place, curiosity grew, which led some researchers to come up with very creative ideas about who these people of the past might have been. Tsuboi Shugoru, for example, founder of the anthropology department at Tokyo Imperial University, suggested that the Jomon people could be the origin of those Ainu referred to as Kuropokur, a race of small people present in their folklore. In the Ainu language, Kuropokur means the people under the leaves of the Fuki. The Ainu believed that the Koropokur were the people who lived in Japan before they themselves began to inhabit it. They were described as being agile and skilled at fishing and were said to live in pits with roofs made of fuki leaves. The Kuropokur had good relations with the Ainu and traded goods with them, deer, fish and other game. However, these small people hated to be seen, so they made their deliveries stiltily, under cover of night. Until one day, a young Ainu man decided to ambush a Kuropokur to see what he looked like. Such rudeness led to the whole race of Kuropokur disappearing, ever, never to be seen again. This is just one of many examples. For some time, Tsuboi and other academics worked on the assumption that the Jomon were foreigners in relation to the contemporary Japanese population. And while it is true that modern Japanese are not directly descended from the Jomon, it is also true that this group left a legacy, genetic and otherwise. As I mentioned earlier, there is no consensus as to when the period began. In some sources, the dates can be as old as 40,500 BC and as recent as 10,000 BC. The end date is less controversial, with most agreeing that the period ended around 300 BC, roughly coinciding with the emergence of the Yayoi culture, not to be confused with Yaoi, which is something quite different. The Jomon culture coincides with the Neolithic period in other parts of the world and is more or less contemporary with the civilizations of Mesopotamia, the Nile and the Indus Valley. However, unlike the Neolithic societies of Europe and Western Asia at that time, there was no organized agriculture or livestock raising in Japan, which makes the era difficult to classify. A period classed as Neolithic is characterized by the emergence of polished stone tools, sedentarization associated with agriculture and animal domestication, and the development of pottery and weaving. Religious and funerary beliefs and practices also generally saw an increase in complexity. Well, the Japanese began using polished stone tools long before other civilizations, back in the Paleolithic. Only in Australia have polished stones been found that are older. Despite their status as intergatorers, the Jomon reached a high level of sedentarization, and the ceramic pieces they created, as we shall see, reached such complexity that they are considered among the most artistic in the ancient world. The manufacture of clothing was also not as simply as one might think, and the ceremonial artifacts they left behind proved that the world was also very rich at a spiritual level. Nevertheless, the lack of animal husbandry and large-scale agriculture activities prevents this society from joining the group of Neolithic societies. As a result, many consider it to be a Mesolithic society, a transitional moment between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. I thought, ultimately, the truth is that Mesolithic society might not be a perfectly adequate term either. And that's why you will see some sources refer to the Jomon period as the Japanese Neolithic, while others call it the Japanese Mesolithic. And we'll, find still, and we'll find still other sources that avoid using either terminology, 
and prefer to consider the Jomon period as something unique. The view that the Jomon were the pinnacle of a hunter-gated society, this is the most a society can develop while still living off nature, is not uncommon. Artifacts from the Jomon period have been discovered in numerous places, from the northern island of Hokkaido to the country's southernmost archipelago. But they appear most frequently in central eastern and eastern Honshu. Thanks to these artifacts, we know that the more sedentary lifestyle that characterizes the populations of the era developed around 5000 BC, and it was from then on the most famous camps were built. The largest covered an area of approximately 100 acres and had the capacity to house around 500 people. It is also known that the German people settled in different areas depending on the climatic conditions. In colder periods, they moved closer to the sea, and in warmer periods, they moved inland in order to take advantage of the thriving flora and fauna. Along with the ceramic pieces, the dwellings were one of the elements that changed the most over the course of the period, going from simple shelters to complex pit houses, built around a central fireplace and with a structure supported by pillars with the capacity to house five people each. In many settlements, what are thought to be ceremonial areas were also found, as well as storage pits. Finally, something that also underwent significant variation was the total number of inhabitants. Around 5000 BC, the population grew from 20,000 to 100,000, then doubled to 200,000 before halving again towards the end of the period. Like the Japanese today, the Jomon people were victims of many natural disasters, such as volcanic eruptions, typhoons and floods. During the Jomon period, the Akone volcanoes, the underwater volcanoes of the Aira Caldera and the Mount Sanbe seem to have erupted, this last one on three different occasions. The activity of Mount Aizu in northern Kyushu seems to have been so violent that it made the surrounding area uninhabitable. One of the most curious aspects of the Jomon culture is that to this day no evidence has been found of any battles or wars. No fortified settlements, defenses, such as fences, ditches or moats have been discovered. The creation of weapons, such as spears, bows and arrows, was not carried out in abnormal quantities at any time, so there are no signs that they were used for purposes other than hunting. And as far as swords are concerned, these have been found in even smaller numbers and seem to have been used for ceremonial purposes. Only towards the end of the era, close to the transition to the Yayoi period, there also doesn't seem to have been any human sacrifices or the need to bury masses of corpses at once without the opportunity to hold ceremonies. In a 2016 article by Izashi Nakao and collaborators, bone remains from 13,000 BC to 800 BC were studied in search of patterns indicative of violence. The mortality figures attributable to violence were 1.82% in total and range from 0% to 3.45% depending on the phase studied, with later phases showing higher percentages of violence. These percentages constitute further proof that there were no wars during the Jomon period, or that, if there were, they did not occur in significant quantities. Since being so low, they can be justified as being the result of interpersonal violence, disputes and small-scale acts of aggression. Skeletal injuries resulting from homicidal intent are particularly abundant when compared to the other phases of the Jomon era towards the end of the period. Examples include a male with his hip pierced by a bone point at the site of Kamikuroya, bones pierced by arrowheads and broken skulls. You might wonder why is all this so important and, in a way, surprising. Well, there are theories that postulate that war is a component of human nature and indispensable for the evolution of human behavior, acting as a form of selective pressure. In other words, that it is inevitable and that no matter what period we look at, it, is always, it will always be marked by war in one way or another. However, what we might be seeing here is more than 10,000 years of continuous peace. 10,000 years. Do you know what 10,000 years is? The period from the beginning of the Jomon era to the phase known as Middle Jomon is twice as long 
as the time between the construction of the Pyramid of Giza in Egypt and the, and the 21st century. I don't think our minds can even comprehend the duration of this magnitude, much less without war. In the modern world, wars break out as often as pimples appear on my face. So it's easy to believe that this is simply natural. Boys will be boys, but in this case, humans will be humans. There will always be a war or two from time to time. But if it's true that there were no large-scale conflicts in the Jomon period, that would mean that not all ancient Aether Gatorade groups universally practice warfare, which in turn will mean that violence might indeed be part of human nature, but that war is not an obligatory manifestation of said violence, but rather something influenced by other factors. The arrival of the Yayoi around 300 BC also brought complete sedentarism, agriculture and the concept of owning land. The more than 10,000 years of supposed peace came to an end. I'm going to proceed by talking a little about the technology of the Jomon era, the skills that those people possessed so that they could live their daily lives in the best possible way. Everything related to art, as well as spiritual ceremonies, will be covered in a separate video. This includes ceramic pieces as a whole. There is so much to talk about pottery that the topic deserves to be dealt with separately. Jomon technology, for the most part, consisted of fundamental tools built from stone, wood and bone, such as knives, axes, bows and arrows. The artifacts that have been found are in many ways similar to those that were discovered in other parts of Asia and Europe during the Neolithic era. The presence of bow and arrows, for example, is clear proof that we have left the Paleolithic behind and that there has been a change in terms of the prey people had to catch. With the disappearance of the megafauna, whose hunting consisted of a battle of endurance, if you remember, the Jomon people had to put more effort into chasing fast and agile animals, such as wild boar and deer. As these animals are difficult to hunt with spears and other short-range weapons, the bow and arrow proved to be excellent substitutes. In addition to stone tools, various traps helped the Jomon in their hunting activities, and new fishing equipment was also developed, such as hooks and harpoons. Even shipped stone tools became more sophisticated and diverse. We already know that the Japanese Paleolithic people had a technique for polishing stones. They were pioneers in this aspect. But the polished stone tools of the Jomon period were much more refined works than their predecessors. There is evidence that the Jomon people built boats from large trees and used them to fish and travel. Remains of what are believed to be dugout canoes, also called log boats, have been found in archaeological sites from the Early Jomon, Middle Jomon, Late Jomon and Final Jomon, with 80% of the boats dating precisely from the last two phases of the period. Traces of more than 74 canoes have been found in 45 different archaeological sites. The oldest canoe was found in the Toriyama Shell Mound in Fukui Prefecture. It was 6 meters long and 60 centimeters wide and was made from a Japanese cedar tree. Cryptomeria japonica. The trunk of this tree was split in half using stone axes or adzes and then worked by fire into a suitable shape. The surface of the finished product was then carefully polished. A blunt prow dugout was found at the Kamo archaeological site in Shiba Prefecture, along with two large paddles and six small ones. The canoe, with its 5 meter length, was capable of transporting bulky and heavy goods. It was able to transport materials such as obsidian, flint or asphalt over long distances. This type of complex canoe was also, would also have been used by the Jomon people for deep sea fishing. An even larger canoe was found at the archaeological site of Uraniu from early Jomon. Because it was 1 meter wide, it is estimated that it was 8 to 10 meters long. Wood was not only used to make boats and tools. The Jomon people also used it to frame the walls of storage pits and to build posts to support the houses they lived in. And, of course, they used it as, as fuel for fires. They learned to work with wood from various types of trees. Chestnut, Japanese cedar, mukunoki, inugaya, Japanese nutmeg and camphor. 
Of all these, Cessna 3s were perhaps the most important, because as well as being used in construction, they were also one of the most significant sources of food. In fact, wood was such an essential material that some people called the Jomon culture the culture of trees. Of all the innovations that took place in the Jomon period, however, the most complex was undoubtedly the technique of applying lacquer, lacquering. This process was extremely time-consuming and complicated. The Jomon people had to refine the sap of the poisonous urushi oak and produce lacquer from it, which took mounts. The pigments iron oxide, kokotar, and cinnabar, mercury sulfide, were then used to turn the lacquer red. Finally, the red lacquer was used to decorate ceramic pieces, wooden balls, baskets, combs, bows, and other accessories. It is believed that most of these items were created for special purposes, namely to be used in spiritual ceremonies. Sometimes funerary costumes were also lacquered in red. According to the book Japanese Prehistory, the Material and Spiritual Culture of the Jomon Period, by Nelly Nauman, the use of cinnabar, dragon's blood, in Japan dates back to the early Jomon period, becoming more frequent in the late Jomon phase. Cinnabar obtained the status of a mystical pounder because it is produced from volcanic activity and hot springs. In other words, it is produced from the heat coming from the center of the heart. Its red color represents both the heart, blood, and the flames of fire and is associated with vital force. Because it was a specialized activity, lacquer production was carried out on a temporary basis. But this was not the only craft that required an exclusive location. There were several temporary bases where the Jomon community dedicated itself to making a particular craft. There were bases for the production of figurines, bases for the production of earrings, bases for the production of shell bracelets, and so on. And speaking of accessories, the Jomon people produced the most diverse types, pendants, eye pins, combs, earrings, bracelets, among others, and these were made from various types of materials, stone, clay, shell, horn, animal teeth, and the list goes on. Gemstones such as obsidian, amber, and jade were also used. And yes, we are going to talk about Magatama, but not in this video. Some accessories were made from exotic materials. For example, the Patella Scutellaria Optima shell could only be found in very specific areas, such as Izu and Yakushima, but was used to make bracelets, even thought it would have been much easier to create a bracelet with, a more, com with more common shells. The taste for rare artifacts, therefore, was already part of the culture. From a shell deposit in Kamitakatsu, in the town of Tsuchirua, 22 species of shells were unearthed, that are believed to have been collected by diving in the open sea for the purpose of making bracelets. Some of these shells are Anadara satoi nipponensis, Glycimeris albolineata, and Meretrix lamarki. The first earrings worn by the Jomon did not require the airlobes to be pierced. This type of earring, found on, only on the Kanto plane, consisted of a flat circular stone with a slit where the lobe was inserted. It was only later, in the final phase of the Jomon period, that earrings that required ear piercing began to be used. As ceramic is lighter than stone, the latter was more commonly used to make these earrings. Men and women wore different accessories, and most earrings were found near female skeletons, while waist pendants were mostly found near male skeletons. Still on the subject of discovery of techniques, cordage is another example of technology dating back to the Jomon era. The Jomon people produced twisted cords which were then used to make ropes, baskets and nets. Cordage was also the basis for the creation of clothing. Although clothing is perishable and therefore not likely to be found thousands of years later, several fibers have been unearthed from various archaeological sites, as well as needles made from bone. The oldest textile product found in Japan is a rope made from hemp, which dates back 21,000 years and was found in the Toriyama shell mound in Fukui prefecture. The fibers of the hemp plant were therefore one of the types of fibers that were used in the manufacture of clothing, as later discoveries in the Kyushu region can attest. The hemp plant produces the strongest natural fiber known, 
and the fabric it produces is three times stronger than fabric made from cotton. To obtain these fibers, the plants have to be pulled out of the ground and left to rot. This process is called filed retting or dew retting. During this period, microorganisms weaken the layer of glue between the fiber, which you want to obtain, and the woody core. The retting process can take up from 2 to 6 weeks, depending on the objective. It is important to turn the plants over 1 to 3 times so that the phenomenon occurs evenly. The fibers then separate easily from the stems and can be used to weave clothes, baskets, ropes, nets and shoes. Also in Toriyama, an artifact was discovered that was warped from rami, a flowering plant from the nettle family. But don't be alarmed, it doesn't sting. From the study of fiber remains found in archaeological sites built during the various phases of the Jomon era, in order from oldest to most recent Toriyama, Senai Maruyama, Eijo and Sanogakoi, archaeologists know that the Jomon people made clothing from the fibers of two species of false nettles. Boemeria nivea and Boemeria tricuspis. The technique that the Jomon used to turn fake needles into fabric has stood the test of time. Over the centuries, this rudimentary technique was perfected, reaching its apogee in the Eshigo Jofu and Ogie Shijimi fabrics, which are recognized by UNESCO as intangible cultural heritage. Hanging fabrics can be found in Niigata Prefecture. <sighs> Another material that was used to make clothing was mulberry bark. Flexible strips of bark were extracted from young mulberry trees, crushed with a stone and weaved into a kind of robe. So we know what materials the Jomon used to make clothes, but what about the appearance of those clothes? It is possible to formulate some hypotheses based on the observation of figurines from the Jomon era, since some of them represent dressed characters. Thus, it is possible to conclude that the Jomon people wore waist clothes, which were adorned with braids, coats, perhaps from deer skin, and even masks. There is a certain similarity between the designs on the Jomon figures and the clothes worn by the Ainu people. All the amenities I have mentioned, the raw materials, the handicrafts, the tools, all these traveled around the Japanese archipelago. It is known that there was already an advanced distribution network linking the different settlements. The boats created by the Jomon were even capable of crossing the treacherous Sugaru Strait, as researchers proved in June 2002, when they went from the city of Toy to the city of Oma in a wooden hoboat, a crossing of 70.5 kilometers that lasted 9 hours. Trade between the different Jomon groups involved three types of goods. Valuables, such as aid, amber, obsidian and asphalt. Those that could only be obtained in certain regions, for example, something that in principle could only be acquired by settlements near the sea, such as salt and dried seafood, namely fish and meat from marine mammals, was thus taken inland. And handicrafts, weapons, bracelets, earrings, lacquered items, among others. And how do scientists know, you ask, that this trade existed. It's quite straightforward. Some substances are characteristic of certain places in Japan, but have been found by archaeologists in places where they naturally shouldn't be, which indicates that they have traveled long kilometers. A prime example is the obsidian that can be found in the Oshikuzo Pass. This stone is known for its eye transparency, a characteristic that gave it its name. Oshikuzo literally means star droppings. These star droppings were transported to various places in Japan. And to finish off this video with one last bit of technology, let's talk about time. That is, the way the Jomon people marked the passage of time, if they did it at all. Some theories suggest that the Jomon had knowledge of the movement of celestial bodies, sun, moon and certain stars, and that they used these movements to guide themselves in time. They would use phenomena such as the summer and winter solstices, the spring and autumn equinoxes, and the phases of the moon to predict climatic changes, know how many hours of light they had available and predict the behavior of fauna and flora. Some of the stone circles that have been found inside and near Jomon camps might have been monuments built to align with certain celestial bodies. One of the greatest indications that the Jomon could have possessed some level of understanding in terms of reading nature to understand how time works is the existence of the 
of a settlement called Sanai Maruyama. It is believed that this camp might have been a trading center where groups from all over Japan and, over, and even overseas came to trade. However, this would have required a prior arrangement. These people would have to know when to set out in order to arrive at Sanai Maruyama at the right time. Of course, this is all speculation because, in case you haven't noticed, the Jomon had no writing system and without it, it is very difficult to be certain about anything. And yet, this aura of mystery surrounds the period with a certain charm, don't you think? Well, that will be all for today. There was no time to talk about Jomon constructions or the camps as a whole, but I'm sure that in a future video I will find a spot for the topic. If not in the next one, then in the one after that. I've only covered about one-sixth of everything I've researched, so as you can see, the journey has just begun. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. And if you haven't watched the, my videos on the Paleolithic period, I'm going to put the playlist here somewhere on the screen for you to check them out, so feel invited to take a look. They are possibly the most complete videos on the Paleolithic period that exist here on YouTube, at least in English. Which might simply mean that I don't know when to shut up. But I guess you'll be the judge of that. Without further ado, I bid you farewell. Until next time and take care.